Hey Cam followers, welcome to another one of our lives. Um, tonight it's me, Esme, and I'm joined by the lovely Isuru, um, who is a fantastic medicine specialist, but also a nutritional specialist. So um, I'm going to pass straight over to you, Isuru, to introduce yourself, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Esme, and thank you for the opportunity to um, to join this session. It's a, it's a new thing um, to me, so I'm very excited. Um, so as um, as May mentioned, I am a specialist both in uh, canine and feline internal medicine and also in small animal nutrition. Um, I did both of my residencies at the same time at the Royal Vet College in London. Um, my specialization is American boards because my supervisors were American trained, um, but um, I've never been to America apart from holidays and conferences and things like that. Uh, and yes, as I said, I work at the Willows at the moment, seeing cases both in internal medicine and nutrition. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to join you for this session. Oh, we're very lucky to have you, so thank you very much. Um, so uh, it must have been quite hard work doing a double residency together, doing both the medicine and the nutritional side. It must have been uh, extremely a lot of work compared to uh, what I do as a GP. <laughs> I've got a lot of um, respect for you doing that. Thank you. No, it's I mean, it's yeah, it's obviously a lot of work, but it's also that the two things go hand in hand quite nicely. So in that sense, it's it's quite a um, nice thing to do the combination of the the two things and a lot of medicine is nutrition and a lot of nutrition is medicine as well um i have to say i don't treat a lot of osteoarthritis uh in my cases but um i said in the, the nutrition aspects I'm, I'm well averse brilliant so i guess um my first question is just a generic question um when we're looking at nutrition what are we looking for in a well balanced diet for a dog Okay, so I guess what we mean by balanced diet is that it provides all of the nutrients that are needed by dogs and cats, and also very importantly in the correct amounts. So obviously, we always think of uh, nutritional deficiencies in terms of that can cause harm, but also we need to bear in mind that excesses of, of certain nutrients and can also be harmful. And that's you know, certainly particularly the case with things like osteoarthritis as well, and, and uh, juvenile dogs with um, with orthopedic disease where some of nutrient excesses like calcium vitamin d can actually be harmful rather than beneficial so what we mean by a balanced diet is that it provides the correct amounts of these nutrients um, specific for their physiological state so that's also quite important so your requirements as a puppy as a kitten are very different to those uh, as an adult uh, and also to a degree as an older dog so all of these things have to be uh, um, uh, sort of considered, I guess, when we're feeding uh, our cats and dogs. Yeah, it's um, a minefield, really, isn't it? Because there's all sorts of products out there, and knowing whether you're giving the right one or not can be quite tricky to do. So, and, and obviously, we're talking if we're just talking about dogs in general, that's such a broad topic. So, we're going to keep this quite specific tonight. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I think we'll be here forever. Um, so, should we start with the different ages? So, let's say. Um, I think most a lot of the dogs that um, owners will have on here will be older dogs with arthritis. So what sort of diet are we looking for for those type of dogs? For an older dog, yeah. So I guess, um, again, we sort of go down to physiology and to understand what exactly happens in older age in terms of your energy requirements, protein requirements, mineral requirements, and then the idea is that you use this science or physiology at least to base uh, how you feed um, these patients or yeah. these dogs. So if you look at energy requirements in dogs, certainly as they get older, their energy requirements uh, reduce compared to an adult dog. And that's partly because um, of their loss of um, lean body mass. Um, that, that certainly can affect their uh, energy requirements as can the level of activity so so for that reason we'll normally give them maybe something like 20 percent less energy compared to an adult dog um, and also the other important aspect is as the these dogs age they're much more likely to, to become overweight and obese which obviously we know is a big big factor in terms of worsening of arthritis and even causing arthritis um, so they're the key things in terms of energy. When it comes to protein, um, that's a bit, a bit of an interesting thing, I guess, because historically we've looked at protein and we've thought that these older dogs are potentially their kidneys may be starting to fail. So we have to be a bit careful about how much protein we give them. When in fact, actually the opposite is true in the sense that um, their protein requirements increase as they get older because they have more turnover of protein. They tend to lose a lot more protein. Um, and um, for that reason, they need to be given, I guess, a bit more protein compared to an adult dog. Um, 
and that's also certainly quite important with managing things like sarcopenia, which is, a, I guess, a medical term for age-related muscle wasting, something that's well recognized in people and we recognize it more and more in dogs and cats as well. Uh, and that, obviously, again, the, your muscle mass is very important in terms of um, its effect on the um, orthopedic system as well. Yes, definitely. Um, so, yeah, they're the main things in terms of an older um, a diet for an older dog. Okay, brilliant. So if someone, let, let's say I've got a Labrador and um, he's just been diagnosed, he's, let's say he's 10 years old, just been diagnosed with arthritis, um, and I want to make sure that I'm giving you a good diet for that, what, where do I start? What do I do to look for the best diet? So again, so that um, the first step will be to do a sort of a nutritional evaluation and to get an idea, is, is your dog overweight, underweight or uh, just the right weight in terms of working out the energy requirements um, and making some calculations on the base of that. Getting an idea of your baseline health status. So if it's an older dog, you might want to check kidney function to make sure everything's working okay. Is there there any reason where we might want to restrict protein, for instance, in you know, the early stages of kidney disease, etc. Um, and then once you've got that baseline in terms of uh, an idea of body fat content, muscle mass, um, some blood results, then you can make some recommendations as to what the best diet might be. Now, as part of that evaluation, we'll normally do what's called a body condition score, which you may have heard of. So that's sort of a, a thing that vets use to assess body fat covering. Um, I mean, there's different um, scaling or grading systems that we tend to use. My preferred one is a system out of nine, where for a Labrador, we're looking at around about four out of nine being ideal, which is sort of a lean um, dog uh, without any excessive fat around its um, ribs and, and rump, etc. Just as important is the muscle mass. So um, recently, um, there's also been a scoring system advocated for um, uh, assessing the muscle mass. Uh, again, just by feeling the dog, not by doing any sort of fancy tests or anything like that. And that can also give you an important insight in terms of do we think um, you know, this dog has lost some muscle mass? Do we need to do something about that? Yeah. So that's the first step, assessing um, what the requirements might be and then looking at, obviously, what might be appropriate for a diet. So some of the senior diets nowadays certainly uh, will fit, meet those criteria. If you have underlying kidney disease, you might want to feed an appropriate diet for that. If you have an increased um, body condition score, so what we'd call obesity or um, being overweight, then you might want to um, feed a specialised diet for that. So every patient is an individual, so there's not every 10-year-old dog will be uh, treated the same way in terms of its diet. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, isn't it, that there's no one-fits-all perfect diet for every dog. It's exactly. all, yeah, it's all individual. So um, obviously we've talked about the protein requirement in an older dog with, um, with a joint disease such as arthritis. What is the difference between that and a young dog who's been diagnosed with joint disease, maybe de developmental joint disease or, or similar? Yeah, so for um, specifically for protein requirements, um, puppies and kittens uh, compared to adults, adult dogs tend to have a higher protein requirement, uh, which is why you have to be very careful in terms of how much protein um, you feed these dogs. Uh, so make sure you're meeting. The protein obviously is very important, um, mainly for what we call the essential amino acids. So um, which are derived from the diet. So amino acids are the building blocks of various proteins in your body. Some of them are what we call essential amino acids. So these can only be derived from the diet. The body can't make them. Uh, and that's certainly where um, the amount of protein, also the type of protein becomes very important. So uh, meat protein, as an example, will be a better source of some of these um, uh, essential amino acids compared to vegetable based protein so, so that again the type of protein as well as the amount of protein becomes quite important in these uh, in these dogs um, so yeah in general the protein requirements are higher for um, for puppies and obviously they have some other differences as well for example their calcium requirements phosphorus requirements sodium requirements and perhaps probably the most important with regard to what we call developmental orthopedic disease is the energy density of the food because um, uh, one of the biggest risk factors for, for developing things like you know, elbow dysplasia, hip dysplasia, um, especially of those at-risk breeds, is a very rapid rate of growth. Um, and one of the biggest factors that drives that is very energy-dense food. And we have good evidence, good scientific studies showing that um, uh, if you control how, many, how much calories you feed and the rate of growth, that's, that can have a significant uh, beneficial effect in terms of reducing some of these uh, diseases. 
And if they've already got a well-established disease, is there a diet type they should look for? So obviously, um, you want to limit that energy density in the first place so that you're not developing the disease. But what do you do once that's already been established? So then again, I guess it depends on what the previous diet was. If it was on an inappropriate diet, then the first step is to make sure it's an appropriate diet for growth, meeting all the criteria we talked about, calcium requirements, phosphorus requirements, the ratio between the two, um, sodium, energy, etc. That would be the first step. Then I guess we can start looking at would some kind of a supplement potentially help, which you know certainly is applicable to older dogs as well as younger dogs. And, and there's obviously a, a whole number of things out there in terms of um, people use as supplements for orthopedic type disease, um, joint, joint disease, arthritis. We have to be a bit careful in terms of which ones we select uh, because the evidence behind some of them uh, is, is pretty poor, whereas with others it tends to be a lot better. So again, this is where I guess your, your veterinarian will be helpful in terms of making recommendations. Yeah. Do you have specific supplements that you... Um are happy to use or not happy to use? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, the one um, the one I would recommend um, for any dog, a bit old or young, will be the fish oil supplements. Um, and I guess, you know, in terms of the evidence out there, that has the best evidence for it. Granted that even with that supplement, some of the evidence um, is not perfect, um, but there certainly is evidence, a lot better evidence compared to some of the other um, supplements such as, um, you know, the green lip muscle extract and chondroitin, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, fish oil supplements is the one I'd recommend um, as, as, the, uh, uh, as the main um, supplement for you to, to, to use in these cases. We have to be careful in terms of um, the source of it as well. So uh, sometimes fish oil supplements are advertised as omega-3 fatty acid supplements. But they're not exactly the same thing because you can get omega-3 fatty acids from vegetable-based um, oils like you know, linseed oil and also from fish oils. And it's specifically the fish oils that are ones that, that are very important in terms of having that therapeutic effect in not only joint disease, but um, now there's certainly evidence in veterinary medicine that it can help with heart disease, kidney disease, etc. Yeah, and I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have to be a bit careful about cod liver oil as well, because a lot of people like to give that, but it's got a very high level of vitamin A, and so that can be quite toxic if not exactly it. yeah exactly which is one of the reasons why we don't normally recommend that as a supplement because to in order to reach the sufficient levels of your fish oil supplements you might end up giving excessive amounts of your fat soluble vitamins uh, a uh, and also d uh, to a degree as well mm -hmm. uh, which is why ideally you'd um, use a pure supplement just cont containing the uh, the fish oils which are two in particular one called epa or icosapentaenoic acid and the other one called dha or docosahexaenoic acid and they are the two main fish oil supplements that um, have been shown to have a medicinal effect um, in terms of an anti-inflammatory effect oh, brilliant um so um the other question i wanted to ask and you've kind of touched on it so we've, we've briefly talked about um arthritis in the older dog and de de developmental disease in the younger dog um, what do we do in cases where there is um, just muscle loss for whatever reason? Is there supplements we should give alongside protein or what would you suggest? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, it depends on what the underlying cause of muscle wasting is. So there's two main types that we tend to see. One is the sarcopenia, which is the age-related muscle wasting we tend to see very commonly in people and also dogs and cats. And the other form of muscle wasting is what we call cachexia, which is disease-related muscle wasting. And we certainly recognize that um, more and more in conditions like cancer, kidney disease, um, uh, even um, heart disease as well. So that's that's um, certainly a lot more recognized. So in that kind of situation, probably the most important aspect is to look at the amount of protein being fed at the moment. If the protein amount is restricted, then increasing that uh, is probably a, a good starting point. There isn't, I guess, any clear evidence at this stage to say that feeding a higher protein diet will help with that. Um, you know, the, if you look at the human medicine side of things, it's a combination of um, a good uh, amount of protein in the diet, high quality protein, but also exercise. That's a very important part of that because um, they had to have you have to have that sort of resistant training against the diet um, to actually build muscle. Um, so it's not just a matter of just eating more more protein. Um, so that's one aspect. Um, there are, I guess, um, there's more research into this um, uh, side of things. Um, people are looking at various supplements that might be beneficial. 
one of the latest ones I just saw publication not that long ago was um, what we call a, a myostatin inhibitor, which is a um, a compound which is meant to um, um, well, myostatin normally slows muscle growth. Um, so if you can inhibit that, um, then that can help with, with muscle growth, especially after surgery and things like that. So uh, this, I guess, something more for the future rather than readily available at the moment. But um, th there are certainly things uh, in the pipeline, I guess, if we say that. Yeah, that's quite exciting, isn't it? That there might be that as an option going forward. Um, so I guess we've kind of covered broadly what the requirements are for different types of diet with joint disease. And it, it is more, it's hard to say, use this specific bag because that bag of food isn't, as we've said, a one fits all um, scenario. But how can owners weedle out the good from the bad diet? So when they're out in the shops and they're looking for something for their dog, do you have any sort of recommendations on how to find a good food for them? Yeah, good question. I guess that's you know, it's particularly challenging at the moment because there seems to be a lot of information out there about diets, and, and and I think partly we're to blame for that. And I say as a veterinarians because we've not really um, you know been very good at advising you as pet owners as to what the best diet is and what are the pros and cons of these diets are. Uh, and for that reason, we tend to see, I guess, what I would call fad diets, uh, lots of things with lots of people claiming their benefits, but not necessarily good of a lot of scientific evidence behind. Um, so it can be a bit of a minefield when you look at, if you go on the internet and say, what's the best diet for my dog? Um, you're just going to get very confused as to um, you know, what to feed your dog. I guess um, the best advice I would give is try and get some impartial advice and you know, it's uh, people sort of say that if you're affiliated with a pet food company, then it's not going to be an impartial advice. But um, there are certainly bodies like the the WSAVA, which is the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, which is an impartial body um, where they have very useful information on their website. They have a, what we call a nutrition toolkit uh, aspect of their website where they have all sorts of uh, good information uh, for pet owners as well as veterinarians about. Um, looking at pet food labels again that can be very confusing for for pet owners you look at a pet food label and you have no idea you know why is there ash in my dog's food and all these kind of things that I mean if you read a pet food label it becomes very confusing so you know there's in, important information on that website about how to interpret what's in a pet food label what kind of um, minimum requirements you would expect from um, some of these companies that are producing pet food uh, and questions you can even ask them to see are you happy that what they produce is, is the genuine thing um, so that's I guess uh, certainly a, a useful resource um, yeah brilliant we'll um, put a link to that at the end of this as well because I think okay. it's a really helpful link for, for people to look at and um, is is your advice different for when you're advising owners who specifically already feed raw compared to owners that already feed kibble? In terms of to, to manage arthritis or, yeah, so I guess, I mean, so with the raw diets, I guess there's two aspects to it. So there are commercial raw diets, which are balanced, and there's a few on the market um, uh, like that. And there's also the homemade raw or home recipes um, for raw diets, which are, for all intents and purposes, most likely unbalanced. Um, so to, to try and split the two things, I guess, as I said, right at the start, a balanced diet is very important. Um, so if you are feeding a home prepared raw diet, um, unless it's been specially formulated by nutritionists to say that this is a balanced diet, then it's, it's likely you're feeding an unbalanced diet. So that's an important aspect. This is the first thing to, to correct, I guess. The second aspect in terms of raw diets, and I would include this as um, one of these newer um, diets that seem to be very popular out there, but if you look at the evidence behind it, it's, it's not very strong, unfortunately. And, and, and I appreciate there's lots of people out there that are feeding raw diets and with very strong opinions of, about them and have um, you know, really good stories, uh, positive stories about them. But if you look at the science behind it, uh, there isn't anything uh, at the moment um, supporting that and I, and I do have several colleagues who work in the raw feeding industry and I talk to them regularly about doing research and things like that to try and prove their benefits but at the moment uh, there isn't that information out there. The second aspect about raw diets is their safety so I guess as with anything first question is is it efficacious is it meant to do what it's meant to do that's question one. Second question is is it safe and we have 
evidence, uh, a number of studies showing that raw diets can be harmful in terms of their microbial uh, contamination. And there's a number of papers in terms of what it might do to your dog, but also some evidence to say that it might actually affect you and your family as well in terms of uh, introducing infection into the, into the house. Uh, so for those reasons, at the moment, um, I'm against raw feeding, but I'm happy to keep an open mind if the evidence changes, if you have more evidence to, to show it, um, so it's a benefit, then I'll certainly happily listen to that. But at the moment, for me, there's more evidence to say that it's harmful uh, and less to say that it's beneficial. Okay. I think for anybody who's listening who specifically um, feeds raw and, and passionately wants to say on raw food, um, we have done a live with Charlie, the raw vet, and she produces raw food and she can give you some advice about how to balance your raw diet properly because it isn't, I personally couldn't do it because I just, I don't have the time yeah. doing it in a, in a way that I'm giving my dogs the adequate nutrition I think it's a very very high intensity way to feed your dog you know it's easy for me to get a little scoop yeah. twice a day give it to the dogs maybe some treats in between and I just use treats from my normal kibble and that's me done I, and there's no mess I'm not worried about the health and safety side of it and for me that's been the easiest thing and I know that I'm giving what they need so I think that's my big thing with them um, the raw food as you said it's yeah. really difficult to balance it properly um, exactly and, and that's it and if, you, if you don't want to feed a commercial food that's fine there's another option which will be a home cooked diet so home prepared but cooked so uh, and again obviously a balanced diet so with the help of a nutritionist to make sure you're, you're feeding all the correct amounts but also cooking the food so then you negate that risk of microbial contamination and everything associated with that yeah and again something that I barely cook for myself so not something that I would do for my doggies unfortunately but it, um, I have a lot of respect for anybody who's got the time to do that. Oh no, absolutely, I mean, I've got loads of clients around the country who do home cook for their uh, pets partly because they've always done so partly it, it kind of increases their you know their bond with their pet especially if they're treating cancer or something else like that um, so um, yeah it certainly seems to be um, something that's out there but it's not as straightforward as obviously opening a bag of food and and, and and then putting into a bowl yeah and then could you just talk very quickly about the difference between a prescription diet and um, a diet that you can buy in a supermarket so I guess I mean prescription diets um, most of these are designed for specific medical conditions um, so let's say kidney disease an example so kidney diets for kidney disease are designed um, so that they're low in protein and uh, low in phosphorus they're the two mo main modifications because we know based on scientific evidence that those two nutrients can be harmful for, for, uh, for chronic kidney disease or kidney failure. So a lot of these uh, prescription diets for that reason are um, for medical conditions only and potentially can be harmful if fed to the wrong dog for the wrong purpose. So as an example, um, you shouldn't really be feeding a um, kidney failure diet to a puppy because you just don't have enough protein, enough phosphorus for that puppy for its growth. Um, so it actually can do more harm than good. Um, so uh, so the, in terms of prescription diets, most of these are, as I said, for specific medical conditions, whereas the, the supermarket brands are regular for healthy dogs. Um, so I guess very different in that sense. There are obviously within the supermarket brands, your premium diets and the lower quality diets, and they can vary um, significantly in terms of cost as well as potentially you know, the quality of the diet. One aspect about that uh, is in terms of um, the type of ingredients they use. If you look at the company involved in making them, um, if they're a particularly um, big company with good supply chains, good quality control, then they're much like much more likely to produce a premium quality diet at a higher cost, obviously. Yeah. Whereas um, some of the cheaper diets may be um, using cheaper ingredients. Um, so you can you can be, I guess, they might be concerned that they might be um, less beneficial to uh, to your dog. Brilliant, thank you. I think it's a question that comes up a lot um, in just in my day to day work as a GP vet, um, asking why prescription diets are so much more expensive than um, the supermarket brand that they're used to giving, for whichever brand it is. Um, and um, I just wanted you to explain that really, just so that to understand that we're using it as not just a food, but a medicine. Um, Correct. Yeah, yeah, and which is why with a lot of these, what we call a therapeutic diet, a prescription diet, 
it's done under the um, supervision of a veterinarian. Um, so a lot of these patients are on these diets, will have regular checkups, making sure that um, everything's going to plan. Um, yeah, and we, we are lucky. So there is, um, there is a joint um, prescription diet. So that is available, which you can speak to your vets about um, for dogs with arthritis that can be quite helpful and actually contains a lot of the um, supplements that you might want to give separately anyway so it makes it although it's more expensive when you add it all together as the food and the supplement you it becomes equivocal I think most of the time um, do you use do you use a joint um, prescription diet very often in your cases yes yeah, so I guess I mean that would be one option so if you look at my example about the fish oil supplements so how are we going to give that so one option will be to use a veterinary product there's one or two out there that that provide the the specific fish oils, the EPA and DHA in the correct amounts in a concentrated um, capsule or, or solution or something like that. The second option will be to use human supplements, um, kind of you know, fish oil supplements that you and I would buy from Holland Barrett's or some, somewhere like that. You can actually give those to dogs uh, as well. The dose ends up being quite big uh, when it comes to using human supplements. So um, that's the only thing, only drawback, I guess, uh, with that. And then the third option will be to use some of these diets, therapeutic diets, prescription diets, which have those uh, nutrients already inside them. So uh, it provides exactly what you need. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it certainly can be a useful way of getting these supplements um, uh, into these patients, into these dogs, without having to give extra uh, capsules or things like that. Um, should we take some questions? I'll pop of course, yeah. Screen. So Lindsay says, is there any good food for a dog with disc issues on her back? She's had a couple of operations to remove discs from the lumbar sacral junction and a slip disc in her neck with a disc or two that could also cause trouble in the future. She's a nine-year-old whippet and has been diagnosed with spondylosis in her back too. We also have a seven-year-old whippet girl that doesn't have any issues. Fair enough. Okay. So again, that comes down to assessment of, of your particular dog to see, um, you know, is she overweight, is she underweight, um, and make some assessment based on that. So if, uh, if she's carrying excessive weight, then that certainly can have knock-on effects in terms of um, uh, degeneration of the spine or worsening of that and recovery from surgery and things like that. That would be the key thing. Um, beyond that, in terms of specifically with the, with the spine, there isn't really at least evidence based to say that this particular nutrient will be beneficial. Uh, uh, nutrient will be beneficial. Brilliant. Yeah, I think it's more all the other great things you can do to manage them at home, which will be useful. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Um, Paul has said Lyra is on a, a special hepatic diet, meaning a, a liver-based diet, um, with Sentinel and currently prescribed Prevacox and Tramadol for her arthritis. She is being reviewed tomorrow. Is there anything you can suggest that she explores with her vet? She is previously on Cartrophen and is nearly 16. In terms of uh, anything specific for the arthritis or? I think so. I'm, I, well, I mean, I can put some suggestions forward that Cam would say. I think from our point of view, using the home management tool, we've got um, It's My Home 2 tool can be really useful. So it just gives you a, a way to assess um, their home environment and see if there's things that you can improve there. And um, the other different modalities, so maybe massage, physio, laser, um, hydro, they could all be really good options too. Um, I don't know in terms of diet, whether you would mess around with that really if she's on a liver-based diet already. Yeah, so I guess it, presumably if your dog's on a liver-supportive diet, there's good reason to do so. It might be liver failure or something like that. Um, so the, whenever we have this kind of situation, I see that relatively commonly as a nutritionist that we've got two, di two different diseases. We've got arthritis and kidney disease or arthritis and cancer or something like that. I mean, trying to find the best diet that merges the two conditions. and. Sometimes you can find a compromise between the two diets, whereas other times you have to decide, right, okay, this condition is a lot more important than that condition, so let's focus our nutrition with regard to that. Uh, and I guess in this kind of situation where liver disease potentially is a lot more serious in terms of um, you know, life-threatening, then probably the focus should be on that. And then using all the other modalities, which Esme mentioned, um, to try and manage the arthritis uh, making sure obviously that um, the body weight side of things isn't excessive because that can obviously kind of have a significant knock-on effect in terms of arthritis. 
yeah it's the one thing we always hammer on on and on and on and on, and on about is body condition scoring and um as you mentioned earlier about obesity it's just um the worst thing that c the dog can experience on top of arthritis is being obese as well or even just having a little bit of extra weight well ex exactly and then there's actually studies showing that losing as little as five ten percent of body weight can have a significant effect in terms of arthritis um so so that certainly is quite important and we've always thought that excessive body weight it's a mechanical thing so the bigger you are more stress on your joints and, and that's how it happens but actually we know now that it's beyond that because fat we used to think of fat being as a relatively inert thing but uh, it's actually very active metabolically it produces a lot of inflammation lots of inflammatory markers and those markers go on to affect joints and things like that so as an example uh, when people that are overweight they'll actually have things like finger arthritis which which obviously is not a joint not a weight bearing joint but it can have um, consequences in terms of being excessive um, having excessive body weight um, so that, uh, you know, beyond all the other supplements is probably the most important aspect. Uh, if you have a dog with arthritis and it is overweight or obese, losing that weight is, is, is an essential part of managing that patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so next question, Katie. Um, Hi, Saru. My own dog, a Labrador with advanced arthritis, has a sensitivity to fish. Can you suggest anything in terms of joint supplements for him? Good question. So I guess if you're looking at uh, fish oil supplements uh, that don't contain um, fish, um, one option will be there are vegan versions of it. And for people, uh, it's uh, they're based on algae, um, uh, algae uh, plants. Um, so that will be one option. They're quite expensive, but um, there certainly is an option available. Having said that, if you look at food allergies, so um, no, things like fish allergies and things like that, it tends to be the, the protein in the fish that dogs and cats and people tend to react to rather than the oil. So there's a good chance that um, you'll be able to give your dog a fish oil supplement, provided it's a pure supplement, without actually worsening of, uh, worsening its um, its allergy. So it's one of those trial and error things, so I'll probably try it, and if it copes okay with it, then fine. If it doesn't, obviously you might have to look at an alternative, like, as I said, a, a vegan, um, uh, fish oil supplement yeah. and i guess you can still try all the other types of supplements which come under the category of we don't know how effective they are but they're probably not going to do any harm exactly yeah it's just an, another thing to spend money on so you have to just make sure you're spending money wisely I exactly would... yeah. yeah which is why i look at these things it would sort of uh, get an idea what is it likely to be beneficial is it likely to be harmful and then make an assessment on the basis of that Brilliant. um okay, okay let's have a look so we got here. Um, uh, Lynn has asked about vegan diets for for pets. What what's your thoughts on those? Yeah, um, again, this is one of these things that are becoming popular mainly, I think, because of a lot of lot more people are becoming vegan. Um, so they want to do the same for their pets. Um, have to be a bit careful with regard to that, and certainly with cats. Um, I mean, not that we're talking about cats much, but um, cat, the vegan diets in cats certainly is, is probably not recommended um, because of their protein requirements are much higher and their amino acid requirements are also very different. In dogs, you can get away with uh, with vegan diets, um, with uh, but you still can get deficiencies. So um, when they've looked at uh, some of the vegan diets available commercially, there's studies out of America which have looked at the amino acid content, they found um, certain nutritional deficiencies. So what I normally say is unless there's a very good reason to feed a vegan diet, was is not to, uh, it's just to feed a, a normal diet. There is um, some alternative to the vegan diets um, which I've actually tried myself on one of my dogs, um, which are the grub-based diets with quite high protein levels. And if you're going to go for something along the vegan route, then that would be the best thing to go for. Although you're still consuming grubs in the dog's diet, it's at least there's more protein in there than there would be if it was purely plant-based. But again, you still need to be careful with those. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I guess that probably is the future of, of food production, isn't it? Probably, you know, even for us, as well as our dogs and cats. And, and um, you know, they're looking at insect protein as being one of the you know, better ways, more economical and, um, and less harmful to the environment ways of producing protein. So, um, yes, that would be an option. And let's have a little look. Um, Uh, there's a lot of people just talking about um, pros and cons of raw versus kibble. And obviously, we're not going into that in too much detail today. I think um, it's one of the ones where you 
a lot of people ha have their dog on raw and their dogs look amazing and are doing amazing and have been brilliant on it so we're not saying here if your dog's on raw food put them on kibble what we're suggesting is if your dog has been diagnosed with arthritis and you're looking for um diets then to we're kind of wanting to signpost you to where we can go for that um yeah and as i said if, if you're going to feed raw then try and make sure it's a balanced raw diet and as i said there are commercial raw diets out there that that provide that yeah um um so this lady Sue, her young three-year-old, very fit spaniel, has just been diagnosed with arthritis, which I think is always so hard to take when they've uh, when they're only three years old. It's really difficult. She's raw fed and gives her turmeric and salmon oil. Is there anything else that she can do? Yeah, so I guess I mean the first thing I'd ask there is when you say raw fed, is that um, a balanced raw fed or or homemade raw fed? If it's a homemade uh, raw fed, I'd encourage. Um, uh, Sue to um, you know switch to something like a commercial raw diet. That would be the main thing to say. And uh, in terms of supplements, yeah, I mean turmeric. Uh, there's a number of ones uh, out there in terms of um, with uh, supposed or, or um, a hypothesized uh, benefit with arthritis. Um, again, at, at some likely that turmeric is, is going to be harmful, but at the moment I've not seen any clear evidence to say that it's beneficial. Uh, salmon oil, I guess, is a source of um, fish oil supplementation, so that will be beneficial, provided, again, we don't have excessive amounts of your uh, vitamin A and, and D. Um, so, yeah, again, for Sue, the main things are with a very, spit, uh, very fit, healthy spaniel is just to get those home changes in, in place now, really. So avoiding ball throwing and any repetitive injury potentially causing exercise. So jumping stairs can be very difficult, jumping on and off furniture, um, slippery floors, making sure we stay nice and fit, regular, consistent exercise. And then you may want to look down the route of doing some hydrotherapy or physio or um, you know, acupuncture massage, that sort of stuff as well, because that might be quite helpful for you. Um, it sounds like you're already on, on top of diet. Yeah, it's very much an it's a multifactorial disease, isn't it? There's genetic aspects in terms of certain breeds are much more prone to arthritis. There's nutritional aspects, uh, and there's also environmental aspects in terms of exercise and things like that. So you need to try and address all of those as best as you can. Yeah. Um, Lynn is one of our ambassadors. Um, so she's just popped just to say that just to be aware if you've got gallbladder issues in your dog then turmeric has been shown to be quite harmful in those this is the problem with some of the supplements that we think that they because it's labeled under supplement that it's just going to be benign and not do any harm but there are instances where it could potentially worsen things yeah very, very good point again this is where you trust your you need to have good trust that your supplement is providing the amount it's it's meant to provide and, and unlike with medicines where you know the amount of drug in a particular tablet or capsule is very strongly regulated. When it comes to supplements, the regulation isn't as tight. Um, so you have to be very careful in terms of what supplements you might be giving in terms of you might be doing more harm than good. A uh, very good point. Um, Patricia's asked, is feeding tinned fish a good thing? Um, so by tinned fish, I'm guessing you mean sort of what you and I would eat. Yeah. So again, as a sort of a, I guess, a, a supplement or not a supplement, but as a treat um, in, in addition to its regular diet, that's absolutely fine. So when it comes to treats, I normally say roughly about 5-10% of the, the daily calories is, is fine. Beyond that, you start, you're going to start affecting the, the balance of the diet. Um, so yes, no harm in doing that uh, in small amounts. Uh, if, it's, if you're going to feed in the large amounts, then you're probably going to need to have a, a diet, home-cooked diet based on that formulated uh, to make sure it's a balanced diet yeah. and lee has asked what would be the main focus for a diet with an overweight arthritic lab trying to build muscle whilst losing weight at the same time to manage the arthritis very good question yeah so that's one of the classic things we tend to see with weight loss um with obese dogs in particular when we put them on diets you know yes they lose fat but they also tend to lose muscle uh, and that obviously can be detrimental. So one way around that is that you probably find that a lot of these um, diets that have been designed for weight loss are relatively high in protein. Um, and that's one way to, to circumvent that, to, 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 to um, reduce the loss of, um, of muscle mass. So probably the best advice I would give in a situation like this would be to feed one of these, again, what we call a therapeutic 
calorie restricted diet and there's you know several out there um several big companies make these diets that tends to be the better option rather than the feeding less of the same diet um because once um they become overweight and obese it's unlikely you'll be able to get them to lose significant amount of weight just by cutting down the food and the opposite effect you end up having that they end up being more hungry then they start begging for food or they start um, you know eating the cat's food as an example something like that so um so you also have to be careful with that so the best way these these diets have been designed in a way that they're low in calories um but they have uh, i guess what we call satiating effects so they feel full and the way they do that they uh, they have high in fiber high in protein uh, sometimes high in water if it's a canned diet so they don't feel hungry after eating the, the food but also continue to lose weight yeah so there's two types of diets isn't there so there's one that looks at um at specifically the obesity side of it so reducing the calorie and then there's one and and there's one that sort of as you say satiates them but there's also a metabolic one where it's supposed to speed up um the metabolic rate i don't know a huge amount about how the different diets work but i know that there is a few ways you can approach the management yeah there is there is and, and obviously each company has their own sort of special recipe i guess you can say that in terms of what's the best to to, to get them to lose weight and i don't get too caught up in terms of if you tell me that you want to feed the heels metabolic let's say as opposed to the royal canon satiety or the purina oh i'm i'm not too worried about that provided it's one of those diets and it does what it's meant to do. If it's not having the desired effect, and which is where sort of monitoring becomes a very important part, uh, if you're not having the desired effect of the weight loss, then you need to look at changing things or feeding less and things like that. So um, yeah, the most important aspect is making sure that you monitor these, um, the weight loss regularly, and also that we don't have too rapid rate of weight loss. It has to be a very gradual rate of weight loss. And what we normally say is roughly about one to two percent of body weight per week. Um, so if you look at um, an average obese Labrador, um, let's say it's 30 percent overweight, um, that's going to take something like 30 weeks um, to um, to lose that weight. So you know, no crash dieting basically. Uh, this is a slow, gradual, healthy process, a lifelong change. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I guess the question I'd like to ask now is um, for, I guess, for vets and for owners who are looking for more nutritional advice, how would they go about um, coming to see somebody like you with that extra bit of specialism and knowledge? Um, yes, I, mean, I'm, I, I do see um, dogs and cats with various nutritional disorders. So I'm, I'm happy to see you here at the Willows um, for a consult. Um, I also offer some remote consults, which is something that started with the COVID outbreak and something that's sort of continued. Um, there are a few uh, nutritionists around the country um, as well. There's Marge Chandler up in um, Scotland and there's a couple at London, which I, th I think they're still doing some consults. Um, there's not that many of us around, but um, we're certainly happy to help you. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we'll put, pop a link for um, the Willows website um, so you can go and have a look at what they get up to. Um, it's an amazing place, the Willows. It's my local referral centre, so um, Thank we'll you. work these together. Um, so um, I just like to finish up by thanking you. Thank you so, so much, Asira, for spending your evening with us, for letting us pick your brains a bit about food and me asking you lots of random questions. Um, I think it's it's such a simple thing. Like it's the, the thing that we need to keep our dogs alive, that we do day in, day out, is feed our dogs. But actually, it's quite confusing on knowing what diets to use and how to work out what they need and how you should change diets as they get older so it's been great to just clarify some of those things and um obviously um we just really really grateful for you to come and spend that time with us tonight no problems at all very happy to join in hopefully it was useful and um, as i said the uh, the wsava website uh, if you go on there um, there's lots of useful resources on there both for vets as, as well as owners so um you might be able to get some information to help you and if anybody's watching this afterwards, we'll uh, for the next couple of days, I'll keep an eye on the comments. And if there is any questions, I'll uh, pass them on to Asura just to, to clarify the answers for those, if that's OK with you. No problems. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed this evening and I um, hope to see you all again to join us for another talk soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.